in the recording. Okay, and so as we begin, and before I share the bios for our incredible presenters today, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about CDHI for those who don't know. So the CDHI emphasizes questions of power, social justice, and critical theory and making and analyzing digital technologies. Our version of digital humanities places accessible, anti-racist, decolonial, feminist, and queer, trans, non-binary work at its core. We understand our current historical shift in digital technology as an opportunity for social and political transformation. We foreground creative praxis, co-creation, public engagement, and community-based research. We offer fellowships to graduate and undergraduate students, host postdoctoral fellows, provide seed funding and other research support to faculty researchers, provide training and critical DH methods and tools, and host a wide range of events, including this special session with the editors of Reviews in Digital Humanities. And I can say the topic of this session, um, as I just told our speakers, is one of the um, most uh, sought out uh, topics of, of our CDHI affiliates. And so we're so excited to be talking about this today. Um, but to learn more about our work and our upcoming programs and events, you can visit our website. And Danielle's going to drop the website link into the chat. And for those of you on Twitter, please join our conversations at U of T D H N. And that's also going to be dropped in the chat. Without further ado, I am so pleased uh, to be joined today by two editors from Reviews and Digital Humanities, Dr. Rapika Rassam and uh, Tiana Grathenried. Rapika is a, an associate professor in film and media studies and in comparative literature in the digital humanities and social engagement cluster at Dartmouth College. Rassam's author of New Digital, Wor New Digital Worlds, Post-Colonial Digital Humanities in Theory, Practice, and Pedagogy, and co-editor of several volumes, including The Digital Black Atlantic, along with Jennifer Galliano. Uh, Rassam founded Reviews in Digital Humanities, a journal dedicated to offering peer review of digital scholarship outputs, which is supported by the Mellon Foundation. Tiana Grafenried is an English PhD student at Northeastern University studying rhetorics of Black citizenship and Black spatial politics. She explores questions of rhetorical citizenship through the lens of writing studies and civic rhetorical education, critical geographies of race and space and digital humanities. Tiana's published work can be found in composition studies, and she is a managing editors, editor for reviews in digital humanities. So Rapika and Tiana are going to discuss where digital projects live, the reviews model for peer review, other venues for publishing digital projects, and tips for preparing your project for publication. We will then open the floor for discussion and audience questions, and we'll aim to wrap up a few minutes before 1 p.m. And um, while, um, while we're hearing these amazing uh, talks, people can put questions in the chat if you'd like. Um, and yeah, why don't you both take it away? Sounds good. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Julia. We are absolutely delighted to be here. I'm happy to be here on behalf of my founding co-editor of Reviews in DH, Jennifer Giuliano, and to be joined by Tiana Grafman reed um, and uh, who is managing editor with Stacey Reardon. And we've decided to uh, put our, our presentation into sort of a series of questions you might have related to publishing. Um, and you can get a copy of our slides um, here at, at this QR code um, or at the bit.ly link below. Uh, our, we started with this sort of uh, very basic, I'm working on a project, where do I put it? And this question of where do I put it, we very much think of as a question first of long-term maintenance and sustainability and the kinds of decision makings, making that you might have around what kind of platform you're actually publishing a digital humanities project on. So is it going to live on a website, on a web page with a content management system like WordPress? And what's the trade-off there? It said it requires a lot of maintenance, it requires a lot of upkeep. Um, 
that there will be moments where you will discover that your hosting site broke your PHP and you have to attempt to uh, recover what you've, you've done. Um, it may be a question of choosing to use a static site generator. So like Jekyll, which is a website um, generating platform that works with simply uh, a language called Markdown, which is like a very simple version of styling plain text, much more simple than say using HTML to edit a web page. Um, and a little bit of, of um, CSS or cascading style sheets language to customize the visualization of the website. And the exciting side of that is that you don't have a database that's going to get hacked. And so these are sort of some of the decision-making processes that, that go into where something goes in the first place. There's also the question of considering where is your project going to live? Is your project going to live in an institution or are you going to host the project on your own? In my experience in the past, I've had wonderful opportunities to work with our libraries to think about the library as a space of hosting, but that also means a library needs to commit to maintenance and sustainability and preservation, which is a large labor ask for libraries. Um, but then on the flip side, you can self-host and host it on a website of your own. And then you're taking on that question, um, that issue of, of maintenance and sustainability. We have two resources we wanted to point you towards if you're thinking about hosting a project yourself. Reclaim Hosting is a really wonderful place to do it. Uh, if you want to use very common digital humanities tools like, uh, or rather um, platforms like WordPress or Omeka or Drupal, they actually have single click installations built into Reclaim Hosting. So it's very easy to get started and launch a site. And we also want to point you to the Endings Project, which is at the University of Victoria. And it's a project that's trying to encourage people to think from the beginning of the project about what the end looks like. So how are you planning and building into the actual decisions you make about project design, a plan so that when you're done with the project or you wanna sunset the project, that it can still live in a flat or static format beyond your efforts to maintain it. Because we all know the sort of grave of dead digital humanities projects um, is a very real phenomenon. The next question we wanna focus on is what does it mean for a project to be published? Something that's key to remember here is that digital humanities projects are different from other genres of scholarship. I wrote an article, my first period article actually was on this topic in 2014. And in it, I articulated that some of the primary differences are that first, digital humanities scholarship is typically public. Um, we're seeing more opportunities in open access publishing in traditional scholarly genres like monographs or journal articles, but a lot of that scholarship is paywalled. Well, some of it is paywalled. It's not open access, that is. Digital humanities projects are typically fundamentally public. And so that sort of changes how we think about being published, because essentially public and available online is a way of saying that something is published. Another uh, divergence with digital humanities and most traditional humanities scholarship is that's collaborative. And in the humanities, most of us were socialized into a different kind of model of scholarship, that it's this idea that we're the hermit and the hermitage tolling in obscurity until we have this idea and then we take our idea out into the world, which also, by the way, isn't even true because we're always already in conversation, in academic conversation, or we're going to conferences, or we're on Zoom. And so um, humanities analog scholarship is way more collaborative than people want to pretend it is. Then there's the question of when digital scholarship is finished. Um, 
I don't have an answer for you because really the answer lies with you, the project director. And when Tiana picks up and starts talking, she'll address how some of this plays into our decision making and reviews in digital humanities. And then finally is the question of peer reviewed. So there aren't a tremendous amount of opportunities to seek peer review for digital scholarship. Reviews in digital humanities is one of them and we'll later talk about others. Uh, but peer review is the imprimatur for externally vetted scholarship in the humanities. And so typically being able to say something is peer reviewed when it's a digital project is a real way to make a claim to publication and to your scholarship, your digital scholarship being part of a discipline or part of a field. And in our presentation, we haven't planned to say much about distinctions between publishing and getting a digital project peer reviewed and publishing in other publishing more typical journal articles about digital humanities projects and other venues, but it's absolutely something we can talk about in the Q&A portion. Ty, I will, Tiana, I will hand this over to you. All right, sounds good, thank you so much. Okay, so this is where I come in to um, answer the wonderful question of where do I get a project reviewed and what better place than reviews in DH, though there are also some incredible other publications, and we're going to talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, so Reviews in DH, we're a journal that offers peer review of digital projects. So the way it works is all projects are either nominated or self-nominated for inclusion. So you send us an email or someone has seen your project and they're like, wow, this would be great for Reviews in DH, and they send us an email. And from there, we will solicit an overview. So the overview is a 500 word statement. You cover a few different topics. So why is it a public digital humanities project? Who has been involved to make sure that you're crediting everyone who's been involved? Because like Rupsi was saying, lots of different hands in the pot and also lots of people working alongside us. We never do anything alone, right? Or in solitude. Um, you also talk about the progress of the project so far and then other decisions and other things that like need to be articulated to say, this is why this project is robust and how it fits within a larger field of study and not only within the digital humanities. And from that process, we will send your finished overview out to a series of reviewers. You typically recommend reviewers um, and reviewers will write a 500 word review in response. We publish them together on the same page so that we can both, or readers can both encounter your overview and then also how it's being situated in other scholarship. You can go to the next slide or see. So how, how widely read are we? This is just some impact factor statistics, um, but we're really happy and proud to say that we are an international journal. Um, we have been read in 133 countries. We have over 118,000 page views and over 27,000 unique users. And how do we publish again? So nominated or self-nominated projects, we have three pathways for publication at Reviews and DH. So the first is open submissions. I am the managing editor for open submissions and I work alongside Rupsi. So whenever you send an email to the inbox, you're mostly talking to us. <laughs> and then we also have special issues editors and that's where Jen and Stacy work. So there is an editor um, that has been selected to develop a special issue. They propose it, they curate it, and then uh, Jen and Stacy guide them through the process. And then our final and new new mode um, or pathway for publication is topic editor issues. So as I'll talk about in a few minutes, we are really happy. We're expanding our team and our, our publications all the way through. So what do we publish? Um, we welcome all types of digital projects. So there's no, there's no one type of digital projects. I think a lot of people think archives or indexes. I do both of those things, but we're really, really excited about projects that approach DH in a variety of ways. So we do peer reviews, of course. We look at digital outputs of all kinds, but we also look at games. We look at da data visualizations. We look at large corpus-based projects, so much more. So check out our website if you haven't already. 
and how does this work? So I went over this a little bit. Again, 500 word overview, you send it to us and you also send a list of potential reviewers. From there, we will work with you throughout the revision process. We also focus on small scale reviews. Um, we help you refine your project for a variety of popular audience, a variety of readers. Um, so you'll work with a small team of review, reviews members on edits and revisions. Once it's approved, we will then push it to the review process and then work with reviewers in the same way. And a big portion that we focus on in reviews in DH is feedback um, and constructive criticism. So the reviews process beyond so the submission of the O review um, and for project inclusion and reviews in DH, the reviews process is really focused on collaboration and mentorship and constructive feedback. But we really see this as a pathway for people who also feel a little unsure about their place in DH to get familiar with DH projects, a variety of digital humanities projects, but also their own sense of, of the world, their own aptitude and ability and like skills and strengths to be able to give criticism as an expert. Um, so we find uh, amongst our reviewers, we typically attract a lot of young scholars, but we've been really happy to see a lot of older scholars like coming back in, older experienced scholars coming back in and guiding us through the process as well. And we've been taking a lot of notes. You go to the next slide, let's see. Overall, our goal with feedback um, is just to ensure that a, co a, a project itself is conveyed um, clearly, efficiently, effectively, but also we want to see and have project directors capitalize on opportunities for growth. So things that they didn't anticipate that users might need, that's what the constructive feedback that we get in reviews uh, typically looks like. So, oh, I ran into this issue and there was a bug in a previous thing that was published. It says, I didn't know that, I need to go back and fix this, or just ways that the project can grow. So if you haven't considered expanding to this platform, this could be a great place for you to do so. And then that's kind of who runs Reason DH. So I talked a little bit about the split. So there's Stacy and I as managing editors. Um, and then also Miranda Hughes is our associate editor and she handles the production. Um, so she handles a lot of the copy edits and gets everything up on the website. We celebrate Miranda all the time. And then of course, Jen and Rupsi, we all collaborate to give you guys robust edits throughout the process. And are the expansion of our team. <laughs> so we have not yet announced our topic editors. You can expect that to come in the next few weeks. Um, but we recently launched the search for topic editors. Um, we're kind of in the onboarding process right now. But what you guys might especially be interested in are the new categories that we've developed in reviews in DH. Um, so we have 10 different categories. So African diaspora studies and global indigenous studies trans and gender studies, community engaged DH, social justice pedagogy, endangered cultural heritage, Asian and Asian diaspora, Latinx, queer, and reviews in the classroom. So we're expanding in a lot of different ways, both with different uh, studies like race-based studies, but also as well as um, pedagogies and community engagement. We want to see how DH is approached in a variety of ways. And go to the next slide. So what's next? With topic editor issues, um, we are expecting to drastically increase our publication. So we already publish monthly, um, and it's typically an alternation between uh, open submissions issues and special issues projects. Uh, but with topic editor issues, each topic editor or topic editor team will create two issues per year. Um, with a minimum of four project issue, four project reviews per issue. So there will be at least four projects in every issue. That's pretty standard for reviews in DH. But what that means with 10 new topic editors coming on board is that you can expect a lot more publication and a lot more frequency. And so we're hoping, <laughs> we're hoping that we have the reviews to back it up. So some ways to get involved to get started out is to become a reviewer if you're still a little unsure. Um, if if you just want to see some projects, we really welcome you into this process. It's a really strong mentorship opportunity, but also a really strong way to practice. So this is one way to get involved. You can either scan the QR code or use the bit.ly link to sign up to join our reviewer pool. And we match reviewers based on interest. So we match reviewers to projects. No one is reviewing something that they're unfamiliar with. You can go to the next slide, group C. Or you can submit your project for using DH. So like Rupsi was speaking to earlier, um, there are 
it's it's a little difficult. <laughs> it's a little difficult to say that our project is ready. Um, but one way to get started is to submit your project for using DH. Um, again, nominated or self-nominated. And this is what it looks like when we have hit that publication. Uh, but you can submit them to reviews in digital humanities at gmail.com. Um, and these are just some wrap-up slides. So uh, you don't, we we don't gatekeep <laughs> at reviews in DH or deny anyone entry. So we encourage students, independent scholars and faculty, no matter where you are, no matter if you're a junior scholar, if you're just finding your way in the field to become a reviewer or submit a project. We, we, we don't say no one can publish with us. Um, so definitely we warmly welcome anyone who works at the intersections of humanities and technology, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Come see us. Back to you, Rupsi. Yes, thank you. Okay, so how do I know if my project is ready for publication? Um, it's always a really good question. Um, the first is really your gut feeling. Are you ready for it to be seen by people, to be seen by the world, to be seen by anyone? It's helpful sometimes to talk to colleagues and ask colleagues, what do you think? Ask them to play around with the project and get some feedback on their experience as users. And you might think, okay, it's ready to be launched. Or you might say, you know what, there are a few things I want to tweak and, and change. At Reviews in DH, we put the question of when a project is ready in the hands of the project directors. And that's why we actually have the overview process, because the overview process actually asks you to talk about what is the current state of the project? What is, you know, what kind of phase are you in? And how is that? Are you at an initial phase? Are you in a prototype phase? Are you three phases in 10 years in because that allows the reviewers to assess and offer feedback on the project based on where you are, not by where they think you should go or what they assume a project should be, but what you are doing and where you are in your process. Um, so that's how we um, we hit hit the balance. We have rarely, actually only once, ever said, no, your project isn't ready to be reviewed. And that's because there was actually no project to be reviewed. We can't review speculation. Um, we can review as long as there is something we can send to a reviewer along with the overview for them uh, to look at. And actually, it doesn't even necessarily mean it has to be online. So for example, we did a review of a project that was a, a visual, a virtual reality experience um, that involved testimonies from residential schools in Canada. And that's not actually a project that is meant to be experienced online and publicly. It's actually experienced in the context um, in, 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 in settings that are physical settings. And so we actually ended up sending all the materials to the reviewer. So it doesn't mean it has to be online and open and openly available to everyone, um, but just that it needs to be at a phase where a reviewer can interact with it. Um, it's totally natural that when you're doing a digital humanities project that it takes a really, really long time. I've been working on certain things for, you know, almost five, six years, and they're still not anywhere in my mind near finished, and hopefully someday they will be. Um, so it's just about how do we think about phases, small demos, prototypes, get some feedback from us and from the reviews process, and then build on that and think about the framing for the, the next portion of the project um, that you create. Um, the other sort of things that we like to see at reviews that would signal a project you know, being, being um, kind of ready for prime time is essentially that there should be some kind of critical apparatus or some kind of about page that really situates what the project is and what a what a user will experience and what a user will will encounter. A credits page where all the contributors to a project are listed and credited, and. The project should really, in some ways, make clear what its scholarly underpinnings are. Um, and this could happen, you know, within the exhibit or the archive or the data set or the bibliography, but showing that it has a scholarly underpinning, um, that it has sources, whether they're primary sources or secondary sources. And that's not that's not really a reviews in DH thing. That's sort of a DH thing, right? That's sort of what it means to do a digital humanities project rather than say like you have a website and you have some information, you put it online. That you're actually showing that this content 
um, this project that you've put online is embedded in, in humanistic inquiry. Uh, we know you may you may be wondering about other potential places to get a project reviewed. Um, this is we we actually have a list of the places we know um, frequently, regularly, and reliably review digital humanities projects. I won't read these aloud, um, but uh, they're very um, highly repeatable and great places. So if you're looking for something that's not um, like, let's say you're I really want it to be my project reviewed by early modernists. You might send it to the early modern digital review. So thank you very much uh, for this presentation. We want to make sure we leave lots of time for discussion and Q&A. Um, and we are looking forward to, to having a conversation with all of you. Thank you both so much for this wonderful and informative presentation. Um, I'm going to open things up for questions. I have a quick question. First of all, thank you so much for founding this um, journal. Uh, I mean, or whatever you want to call it. It's amazing. I mean, the field needs it so badly. It's just incredible. And it's also really beautifully, um, the website is really nice. Whoever did your design did a great job. Um, so I have a question because about the scale of the, the term project, right? Because some of the big projects have so many outcomes, you know, like one project could have you know, books and digital exhibitions and archives and what have you. And I could see how some of these bigger projects could be reviewed many, many times on the website. Um, so what? how do you help um, scholars understand scale, if you will, about what constitutes a reviewable uh, project? That's a great question. I will, I will answer that. So we, we don't really take a position on that. We wait and we see how a project is presented to us in a project overview. And sometimes projects will say, we would like you to review this piece. Please review this map. And then later, this is actually happening, we're in the process of this. We'll later come back and say, well, can you also review the digital archive piece? And so we will do that. And what we actually will do is we will keep all the reviews of all the components on the same page, which has a DOI. Um, and that way, you know, somebody visiting our page on the project can see all the different um, aspects of a project that's been reviewed. Uh, sometimes people will give us a project overview. I think we just had an example of this, Tiana, right? Where we actually couldn't figure out what the reviewer was supposed to review. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Do you remember that one? What I'm talking about? I do. <laughs> I do. Do you want me to talk a bit about it? How do we? Yeah. Do you want to say a little bit about it? Yes. Um, so in that case, when the reviewer wasn't quite sure um, what part of the project they were supposed to be looking at or what sort of um, approach they were supposed to take during the review process, we typically go back to the project director and we say, "Hey." This is a little unclear, <laughs> and we have a quick discussion is to say that the um, the overview itself needs to be repositioned slightly um, to provide a clear pathway for the reviewer, and also to just suggest a few entry points into that project. So uh, via the website, they can say they can look at these series of pages and really focus on this. Um, so when we're not quite sure what the reviewer should be looking at, uh, we ask the project director to give us a few things that they need more feedback on. Um, so that provides a clearer guideline for the constructive criticism portion as well. And I believe in that case, they actually realized that somebody coming to their project had no idea what their project was. And they actually yeah. made those changes to the homepage even before the review process, because they realized that, oh, if our reviewers and our, you know, the, the journal editors can't figure it out, we might need to make some changes. Yeah. <laughs> I see you have a question. Great, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I'm just going to read a question aloud in the chat from Adam. He asks, if a project passes your peer review, what sort of certification do you give to signify its acceptance? So the reviews are all published in our journal. 
in issues that come out monthly. And so we have a page where you'll have the overview of the, you'll have the, the, the project metadata, and then you'll have the overview of the project and then the review of the project. And that means the project has been peer reviewed. So it's a model that's actually not dissimilar from Bryn Mawr's post-publication book peer review model for classics, which is actually where we were getting um, the idea, uh, thinking as we were thinking about a model where we were really interested in, um, because in that case, it's basically a journal that does book reviews. Um, so that's very much in part of what we were thinking. There may be someone to remove from the Zoom posters based on the chat. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll just take care of that. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Is that me? Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much. What a fantastic journal. I'm I'm new to digital humanities and I cannot believe um, you know, with all my stumbling upon, I still haven't um encountered it. It's such a such a fantastic um kind of a, a guide and a, in a way a kind of shared space, even even for this sort of virtual sharing for people who are um kind of uh, starting their own project. So my I have many questions, but I will ask one. So um I'm an art historian, and uh, uh, recently I noticed there are a few um, new initiatives, um, uh, I, I believe, uh, started from an inst institution at Brown um, to publish digital-born scholarship, um, especially, you know, image-heavy. So these projects come out of um, university presses, so in a way they go through a fairly traditional mode of publication, but I kind of just wonder um, um, whether, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're watching that, like whether you have something to say about um, uh, about that. So I guess, uh, you know, that type of DH project, they try to use the hyper uh, text, uh, the hyperlink um, um, to kind of really explore possibilities of um, non-linear narrative um, and also really image heavy things because of course, because of my um, field, I pay special attention to the art history books. So I wonder, I guess the, the question is uh, whether um, you've noticed that being a new mode um, for DH projects to be published, you know, so in a way, a more kind of closer combination between conventional academic publication, especially book length uh, monographs, and the DH projects, and uh, um, two, um, whether your review, um, whether your journal actually um, has reviewed or um, will also consider um, kind of discuss that type of project. Yeah, thank you. Yes, we have reviewed at least one of the projects that is part of the Brown Publishing Initiative. And I believe, I want to say it was Furnace and Fugue, but I'm, don't quote me on that. But we have, we have for sure, um, we've reviewed, I believe we also reviewed things from Stanford's initiative. So here's the current problem with university presses and doing publishing digital humanities projects is that they do it with grant funding and the grant funding runs out and they stop doing it. And so this is the problem with Stanford. So for example, Stanford has been asking me for five years, can we do your WB Du Bois project as one of our digital project publications? And I said, sure, but I mean, I, until, very, very recently, I worked at an institution with a 4-4 teaching load and I was department chair, so I didn't have time. And so they wrote to me in, about a couple months ago and they said, well, our Mellon funding ran out. And so now we're just going to finish the projects we've already acquired. And so we're sorry, you know, you're not going to be able to be a part of this. And so my sort of thinking has been to figure out what are the alternatives. It turns out University of Washington Press is actually um, doing some experimenting in this space. Um, obviously there's Brown's initiative, which isn't really, it's more of a library based initiative than University Press initiative. Um, there's another press that came and asked me for some advice uh, about this. And I actually said, uh, and what they wanted actually to do was make everybody write an essay about their project and publish the essay to the project. And I was said that's what that's sort of defeating the purpose because what we really need to be doing is actually saying the project itself is inherently valuable in and of itself, and not that we need an extra essay to validate the project, um, like a whole essay, like a twenty-page essay, right? And so, you know, I think that there's 
I think the problem there is that the what what really comes is the value of the university press getting involved in the digital humanities project publishing space is actually when they're at, they're providing support. They're providing a place for the project to live. That was my feedback to the press that asked me for advice. I said, you're actually looking at this wrong. What It's actually not the peer review that's the important part that you provide. It's that it lives under your press and therefore is a project that's part of your press. So we're very different in the sense that we are peer reviewing things and we peer review everything from things that have already been peer reviewed in other places or live on a university press or live at a university library or live on somebody's own web page. And so we sort of hit the range because what we're really interested in is the feedback and the dialogue we can develop and also really getting people in digital humanities or in more traditional humanities methods to actually understand how to evaluate digital humanities projects, which is a gap, particularly for people who are looking at faculty jobs or librarians with tenure line jobs who would want to be able to say a project is peer reviewed for a tenure and a promotion. Thank you so much for that. I'm just drawing out some stuff from the chat. Um, Elspeth says, I feel that unless the university presses get involved, the space will get eaten up by commercial enterprises such as Gale, Cengage, et cetera. Um, and um, Sarah Tu um, says, I saw at least one review in Spanish in poking around the A to Z list. What language do you publish reviews in? Do you publish reviews in multiple languages? And what languages of, project, of the projects themselves do you review? Tiana, do you feel comfortable taking this question? Um, yes, 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 yeah. Um, so we we have published reviews predominantly in English, um, but I will say that we often get reviews predominantly in English. So most of the projects that have come through our pipeline recently have been um, in English, in Spanish, and um, there are some in indigenous languages. Uh, I think I think that's a bit of the struggle. <laughs> yeah, Go ahead, I'll, build, I'll build on that and say we've done two bilingual English Spanish issues in the past. Uh, we as part, so we I should have said something about how we're funded. So um, we started actually just Jen and I and using the PubHub platform that we use with the support of our wonderful friends at MIT's Knowledge Futures Group, who runs PubHub. And then uh, shortly, sort of two months, three months into publication, Mellon came, Foundation came to us and said can we give you some financial support? We don't usually support journals, but we're really interested in what you're doing. So from 2020 to 2022, we had a $66,000 grant um, for the journal. Um, and then in um, this year, we got a $566,000 investment from Mellon uh, in things like the topic editor model, because they're all paid, because we pay people. So except for Jen and I don't pay ourselves, but um, Tiana's paid. Um, Stacy's paid, Miranda's paid, um, and uh, our topic editors will be paid. Part of our the money we got is also money for paying translate for translation, because we're basically committed to taking any language. Mm -hmm. We just have to make sure we can find people who are capable to review projects in those languages. And I will tell you that indigenous one in the indigenous language projects was so incredibly difficult to find reviewers for because there are so few speakers uh, of that language, uh, but we're still working on it and I think it's going to work out. Um, so we do have money for paying for translation. Uh, we have money also through Mellon to pay for reviewers, um, and we're not paying people whose jobs include reviewing as a form of service, but we're pay graduate students, contingent faculty members, um, staff members, cultural heritage members who it's not service and part of their job, um, that kind of service at least. And then we're also, um, we have a project registry, which has been referenced in the chat. The project registry allows people to search through our previous uh, published projects. So you don't have to go through the issue. You can go and look at an A to Z list. You can look by method. You can look by time period, et cetera. So Mellon has asked us to think about the role that our project registry can play in the broader question of discovery of digital humanities projects, um, which is a perennial problem is how do you find projects? Because reviews has served a de, de facto function for a lot of people and for a lot of people teaching digital humanities as a place of finding projects. And, and then we're also, the last thing we're working on with this Mellon money is uh, where Jen and I are working with the nonprofit finance fund to figure out how we can have um, long-term financial security 
for the journal without relying on um, us being institutions because Jen and I are committed to do this till 2030 and then we need to give it to other people um, so it belongs to the community and not to us. So we're expanding is the short version. <laughs> Amazing. And I'm seeing comments in the chat about, chat about how great a model this is. Um, thank you. And I see, oh, I saw one hand up and that just went down. Um, but Kevin, would you like to ask a question? Uh, sure. Yeah, thank you guys so much for this. It, it's amazing, your project. Uh, you covered this, I think, Rupika, you covered this a little, but I've our project, my project is on a static site and there's an archives component and the library is taking forever to, to ingest all these documents. Uh, eventually, and I, it, now I'm thinking it's just gonna take like three or four more years, maybe longer to get this stuff out there. Uh, because it's, it's on a static site, some of the links don't, uh, some of the features of it don't work as they should. They're, they have to write some new code in the back and they've taken a long time to do it. Um, but I don't see that happening soon. From what you said earlier, I should still submit this to your journal with a little note saying, this is where the project is. These are the, the two things that are still being worked out. Is that so what, correct? Yeah, what overview writers will do is say, here's what the project is and here's things we have in development and we expect this sometimes they give a timeline for the development of other features or sometimes they don't so it's absolutely um that's a belief i mean because we recognize i mean digital humanities projects take time and if you're going to wait until you're so-called done with a project you might be waiting forever thank you any other comments or questions yes hi oh. um <laughs> are you able to hear me okay and see Awesome. There's a snowstorm here in Michigan, so I keep losing internet. Um, but thank you so much for such a wonderful um, presentation. Um, I have a question in terms of the opportunities for reviewer. Um, I am a PhD student, so this seems really excited to sort of starting to get my feet wet and really um, think about prepping, but also as a collaborative opportunity as well. I want to know a little bit more about that collaboration, because usually when we think typically of the reviewers, like the project is sent to them and it's sort of isolated. So I want to know a little bit more about what that looks like um, as well. And again, thank you so much. I can take this question. Um, so for the review process, and uh, can you can you tell me how to pronounce pronounce your name? Is it Anna Anna Rina? You disappeared Anna, on my screen. No worries, Anna Ridia. Anna Ridia. Okay, thank you, Anna Ridia, for your question. As a PhD student, I feel you. Um, so the reviews process is is pretty extensive in that. Um, you'll be working predominantly with whoever your managing editor is. So if it's an open submissions project and I'm the one who solicits you um, after you joined our review pool and says, hey, this project seems like it'd be a great fit for your interests. Are you interested? Then we will enter into a dialogue. Um, so you will see the project overview. We'll share the overview with you and give you the opportunity to say yes, I want to do this and I have the space and time for it. Um, or no, this is not the right fit for me. Um, and I uh, hit me back when you're ready. Um, so we'll enter into a dialogue. You will go and write the review. And what we encourage in the process of reviewing and in that collaboration is to think about your experience using the digital project um, as you're as you're going through it. So you go in, you take notes, you're documenting your experience, you're documenting things that were sticky for you. So processes that didn't quite work or places that you want to expand. And from there, you're compiling your review to say, here's what the project is, here's what it does, here's how it functions. You can focus on the production value of a project, um, what works, what doesn't work, et cetera. And then also places of growth. So what do you want to see? Uh, when you're reviewing, you're writing for both a, um, a larger audience to say people in this discipline would 
want to see this project grow in this way. And also here's something that I think would be of value to the project. So that is kind of what you're bringing as a reviewer. In terms of collaboration, we really treat the review process as a dialogue. So it is as dialogic as possible. You're speaking to me in the sort of meta genre, you're speaking back to the project director and the editor um, and that sort of feedback. Is that what you were thinking of in terms of your question. And also, Rupsi, if I missed anything, let me know. Terrific. Awesome. I'm so glad. Other questions? I, I just also want to uh, say that Tayana put a uh, quick link to the review process guidelines in the chat um, in case anybody is interested in that. Yes, Elspeth. I also, I also agree. Um, with regard to research design and work in phases. All projects are growing. Um, there have been many times, and I've worked on a variety of digital projects where I've been like, I think we have to pause and rethink a few things. Um, and in working with the managing editors, and I came on board as a managing editor in October of last year, um, but like in working with other managing editors, so with Stacy, and also in introducing topic editors and working alongside authors, um, there have been oversights that have been some of the smallest things, but change projects entirely when you get a new user. So someone who's not yourself, who doesn't see the project as closely to say, oh, what if you did this differently? Other questions? I know we wanted to wrap up at 1255, but I think we can squeeze in another. Well, what, one of the things that we're doing at CDHI is we have been creating um, support, uh, teams to support faculty research projects, including uh, who's our DH developer who's here, hi Matt, um, but also uh, collaborating with our faculty of information, which has a great program in user experience design. So we have uh, a user experience design MA student, a co-op student who's working with this team that consults with faculty members about developing their projects. and. Um, thinking about the end user and how they're gonna be navigating the, the uh, digital project from the very get-go is kind of what we're trying to, to help uh, faculty and other researchers think about as they set up their projects from the beginning. Yeah, that's so incredibly important. Um, you know, one of the things that I've been sort of harping on, on lately is um, the way that Alex Hill and I have framed minimal computing and the minimal computing special issue of Digital Humanities Quarterly that came out in May, which is really the sets of questions that you need to be thinking about with project design from the very beginning are around what do you need, what do you have, what, what must you prioritize, and what are you willing to give up? Because um, I don't know, I feel like I've been having a lot of experiences lately where like I'm working with people who want everything and then get unhappy when you tell them you actually can't have all those things, um, at least not under the circumstances in which we're working on them. And so um, I think that there's... I everybody's so lucky there to have that team um to consult with and also just a suggestion that if you ever wanted to do a special issue of work coming out of your center that would be very very cool and a way to showcase the work that you're all doing um at toronto among digital humanists thank oh you. well thank you that's very generous we'll have to uh chat offline about that possibility Thank you. Um, I want to draw attention to uh, Danielle's uh, dropping in the chat that we are accepting special uh, expressions of interest to work with our UX design team for the summer or fall of 2023. So look at that if you're interested. And also Alex Keener um, wrote, thanks for this great presentation. I'd love to hear more about this issue of finding a place for projects to live, especially if there isn't a clear service model to build or sustain in the library or elsewhere uh, on campus. And I think that that will be our last question for today. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, for me, actually, I've really never um, accepted one case actually hosted a project with an institution because I feel like there's sort of questions around intellectual property and ownership that I really don't want to deal with or also questions of certain levels of access to actually controlling my project that living on a library server, for example, might actually preclude me from. Uh, and so for me, I've always self-hosted things on Reclaim Hosting and just done it myself. Mm. And uh, Or in the case of things that needed a virtual machine on um, a droplet on DigitalOcean. And so, I mean, that means you're assuming the responsibility of maintenance yourself, which means you have to learn how to do it if you don't already know. And so that is really hard and that's a lot. Um, 
certain, we also are seeing, you know, um, with a platform like Omeka, which is used a lot, a platform like Manifold, a, a publishing platform that's used a lot, um, they do offer paid hosting. It's usually, I mean, it, it sort of varies about how much it costs, but I mean, Manifold, I think it's probably like 5,000 a year or something like that um, for hosting and total support. And so, you know, that's a potential um, avenue as well, um, the kind of paid hosting that certain platforms are providing. Um, you know, I think the other, you know, GitHub, depending on if your project's a static site, um, like built with Je Jekyll, you can host it on GitHub and you can even point a domain at the GitHub hosting. Um, so there are a lot of different options. It's just that for every choice you make, that there's a certain kind of trade-off. And that's why, you know, going back to Elspeth's comment, why you need to be think we think about this from the beginning of a project, um, just to ensure that, you know, the project design is matched to the question of where it's going to live and who's going to be maintaining it and sustaining it. Um, and I'm not a librarian, but I'm deeply sympathetic to the cost. I, and I don't mean necessarily financial cost, but certainly yes, but also the labor cost of librarians who end up being responsible for other people's projects um, who can't maintain their projects on their own. Yeah. I would um I would agree with with Rupsi. Um, even at Northeast University, I'm I'm similar in that I typically um, launch a project on my own, um, and I take on a lot of the control and scaling up the project with regard to user experience, um, and things like that. But um, there there is kind of a hidden barrier when you decide you want to transfer your project off of institutional web space. Um, it's not necessarily a one-to-one, -one, okay, I'm going to move it to reclaim hosting. Sometimes you move it and everything breaks. Uh, and so right now I'm supporting two different projects separate from your using DH, so just at my own institution and rebuilding the project entirely, which also means rescaling user needs and rescaling user experience. So um, we really do want to emphasize, or I want to emphasize um, that it, it does require rethinking things. It does require um, rethinking your time, your energy, accessibility, uh, there are a variety of concerns. So as you're thinking of your project or if you're early in the process, um, think about where you wanna start and what models will be most sustainable for you. And let me just add one thing, which is right now I'm in the process of quote unquote, moving reviews from Salem State to Dartmouth. And it actually doesn't live on either anybody's server. It actually lives <laughs> on, on MIT's server, but it's actually for Dartmouth's concerned about intellectual property and ownership and clearing the rights and making sure that like Salem State's not claiming the rights for me, blah, blah, blah. So it's not, it is it a large of it is about the actual technological move, but it's also about the sort of conceptual ownership, IP dimension, uh, intellectual property dimension of of moving a project among institutions as well. Yeah. Oh. Thank you both. Those are all such important points, um, and certainly we see this issue in CDHI all the time of like people creating a website and, and not thinking through these things at the beginning and then really paying for it in the back end. So <laughs> it's really important. Um, I'm going to wrap things up. I want to say thank you both so much for this talk. There's so much I'm taking with me um, from today. One, one thing that I'm really taking with is how generous and collaborative your peer review process is. And so it's like not only the DH, or, or sorry, um, digital humanities work that is collaborative and generous, but so too are you sort of remaking this uh, peer review process in these really fundamental ways um, that really allow for co-learning um, within the discipline. So I want to thank you so much for everything um, that you've given to us in terms of your time and your knowledge today. There's lots of thank yous in the chat. Um, I'm going to drop into the chat right now a feedback form that we would love everybody here to fill out if possible. Um, and I also want to say there's many upcoming events at CDHI, including a Praxis workshop, on the Women's Writers Project and a lightning lunch on building DH Labs, which are both happening next week. And you can register for these and many other uh, events on our website. And oh, thank you, Danielle, for dropping those links. And thank you again to everybody for attending and especially for to Rupika um, and Tiana for, for your wonderful presentation and for answering questions uh, so well. Thank you. Thank you. I highly recommend the Women Writers Project. I've worked on it in the past myself. Um, and I know Julia and Sarah very, very well. So if you can go, I would say go.
<laughs> thank you so much. This is wonderful. Thank you. Guys. Thank you both. It's excellent. Thank and thank you, Julia, for hosting. It's a Thanks wonderful so afternoon. Thanks for everyone who joined us. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. <laughs>